Well, I'm going to go ahead and get things going. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Bill Pop. I'm president and CEO of the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation. Thank you so much for joining us for the April edition of the AEDC Voice webinar. Uh, we've got a great program for you today. Joining us will be Heather Handyside, GCI's Chief Communications Officer, who's going to give us a great presentation on some happenings at GCI. Uh, but before we do that, as we always like to do, we are generously sponsored by People AK. Um, and we want to give them a moment to uh, share with us some best practices from People AK. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie Lowers, who's just going to give us a couple of quick pointers. So Katie, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Um, thank you again for allowing us to host with you such a, a special thing. We get to share a lot of good information and uh, partner with different um, community partners. So one of our best practices today that we're kind of focusing on um, with, with all the changes in, in the market and the cost of living, inflation, gas prices, we like to start isolating variables of how do we keep and retain talent. So uh, we have some best practices for looking at pay. Um, you might wanna start with making a plan for conducting regular market pay studies for, for your team. Uh, teach your managers to have those effective pay conversations to improve the perceptions of compensation and just allow for clarity all across the board. Encourage managers to partner with some compensation experts, people who could do salary surveys when making those pay decisions. And then when market level pay just isn't possible, it's not gonna work use development, recognition, engagement, and pay conversations to explain the value that, that those in individuals have for your organization. And then just a reminder, all organizations need to support pay strategies with science-based management strategies um, because there's way too much information out there to, to not have clarity and, and um, transparency. So that's all from us. Thank you so much, Katie. Really appreciate the support of people like Kay for the webinars and for the great pointers that they always share at every one of our events. All right, well, let's go ahead and start diving off into today's presentation. GCI is continuing to close the digital divide between urban and remote areas, dramatically improving the delivery of a wide range of critically important services to Alaskans. Most recently, GCI deployed two, giganet, uh, two gig internet in 22 communities across the state, including Anchorage. Many customers in the lower 48 can only dream of these speeds. DCI will soon turn up these speeds in, on Alaska as it completes the first phase of the $58 million Aleutian Fiber Project later this year. Join GCI today to hear about the opportunities this kind of connectivity brings, including remote working and learning to name a few and hear about GCI's plans for investment in rural Alaska. That's an overview of the presentation. Just a quick note about GCI. We, GCI is headquartered in Alaska and provides data, mobile, video, and voice and managed services to consumer company, uh, consumer business and government and carrier customers throughout Alaska, serving more than 200 communities. The company has invested more than $4 billion in Alaska in its Alaska network and facilities over the past 40 years and recently launched true standards-based 5G NR service in Anchorage, now the nation's northernmost 5G service area. Learn more about GCI at, of course, www.gci.com. Our presenter today is a very familiar face to most of us in the business community, but we don't want to assume that everybody knows Heather. Uh, so let me just give a quick uh, bio on Heather. Heather Handyside is GCI's Chief Communications Officer. In that role, she oversees public relations, state government affairs, and the company's internal and external communication programs, and serves as corporate spokesperson. Heather has more than two, get two decades of experience in emergency management, crisis communications, and government. She served as press secretary to U.S. Senator Mark Begich, Anchorage Deputy Municipal Manager, and emergency manager for the municipality of Anchorage. Heather serves on the boards of the Anchorage Park Foundation and Girl Scouts of Alaska. And she lives in Spinard with her husband, son, and Aussie doodle named Bosco. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the AEDC Voice, Heather Handyside. Heather, the floor is yours. Well, thanks for that nice introduction, Bill. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And... You know if you guys see that great 
So I wanted to give you an overview of uh, GCI today. We're going to talk about um, kind of uh, uh, our current service offerings and operations today. Then I'll go through our urban operations um, and then talk to you a little bit about closing the digital, the digital divide and also the funding that is uh, coming available, kind of the tsunami of uh, federal funding that we're um, watching very closely and as a real opportunity for um, Alaskans. So GCI has been serving Alaskans for more than 40 years. We have about 2000 employees and we serve over 200 communities, about 97% of Alaskans live in GCI's footprint. We have 30 retail, retail stores. And as Bill mentioned earlier, over the past 40 years of service, we've invested $4 billion in our network and facilities across the state. Um, and I think, you know, and I have to say, just going back, you know, that's our founder and CEO, Ron Duncan. Ron has been with the company, you know, he founded the company. And um, it really has been through his leadership that we've been able to achieve such great things. And when Ron and I go to events, you know, across the U.S. and people talk, you know, from other telecommunications companies talk about how they're connecting their state, we're like, that's pretty cute because this is what we're doing for Alaska. It's a huge state. There are huge opportunities, but there are also really big challenges. And if you look at it from a business perspective, um, it really presents the challenge of getting um, economies of scale to deliver the technology and the connectivity across these vast distances for you know, usually very small populations. Um, but with that said, GCI has invested aggressively. We are always looking for the new, newest technology. We're looking for ways that we can push our services further into rural communities and remote communities. And this gives you a snapshot of where we are right now. Um, the kind of the light blue uh, area is our Terra network. That is a microwave network that serves 84 communities and provides access to 45,000 Alaskans in Western Alaska. The darker blue is the fiber network. That's kind of the backbone of our network and almost everything loops back to our fiber network for connectivity. The yellow spots are where our 5G wireless service is available. Um, other wireless service is the kind of salmon color. And the dotted blue and green lines are uh, current or proposed projects that we're working on to deliver fiber um, further into Alaska. And sometimes when we, especially when we go to DC or we show other folks kind of the map of our coverage area, they say, well, that's not really impressive. Look at all the gray area that is not covered. And that's why we like to bring out the Alaska Population Center map. If you look at you know, where the population centers are versus where our services, you'll see there's almost complete coverage. Um, and I think this is, this really is an important illustration because as we go through this presentation, I really wanna demonstrate to you that though there really are, there is work to be done to uh, close the digital divide in rural communities. Alaska is far ahead of many other states in terms of the connectivity, the level of service provided to uh, the population. So looks can be deceiving if you're talking about coverage areas and, and service, um, because you know, we really are covering the population centers. One of the things that I think this group would appreciate especially is the unusual challenges that Alaska has. You know, we're all very familiar with uh, the challenges most projects have in rural Alaska or building out. It's the terrain, it's the climate, it's the vast distances. But for GCI as well, we have challenges, and I know many folks uh, for companies on this call may have the same challenges. It's really um, the overlapping um, ownership of the land and the strict regulatory nature of many of the protected lands that we want to serve. So, um, and while this may be challenging for a company who's building a facility on a certain parcel of land, for GCI, when we are building out our preferred communications connection, fiber, to have to have a straight line or you know slightly curved line of fiber through uh, vast distances of you know overlapping regulatory um, uh, obligations, it, it's, it can be incredibly challenging. And because of that, we need a variety of tools in our toolbox to connect Alaskans. So that means where we can, we use fiber to provide connectivity where fiber is not practical from a cost or from a uh, construction or a regulatory perspective. We'll use microwave connections, which are 
kind of repeaters that, um, you know, we, they sit on the landscape at different points and they connect to each other and provide service that way. Um, we also use geostationary satellites, which are satellites that remain, uh, that rotate with the earth and remain above Alaska to provide um, connectivity. And we're also exploring LEO satellites in the future. Those are low earth orbit uh, satellites that I think folks have been hearing a lot about, especially recently. So with all of those um, mechanisms or platforms in place for delivering service, whether it's fiber, microwave, LEO, or GEO, for, for GCI and for the industry, fiber is by far the preferred standard. Um, fiber is known as the gold standard of connectivity because it provides almost limitless capacity and the ability to upgrade. We have the fiber, you have the strands, and to continue to upgrade the service, you simply have to um, upgrade the equipment at either end of the fiber. Fiber optic is you know, by far the preferred method. And I bring that up because I think that um, as we have these conversations about investment that needs to happen in Alaska in the coming years to bridge the digital divide, to close it, um, there'll be lots of options available. And I think folks have to keep in mind kind of what is the, the long-term solution, um, what's the best solution for each community and what's possible because fiber certainly isn't possible um, to deliver service in every community in Alaska. So let's talk a little bit about our urban services, which GCI really defines urban in our connectivity conversations as any community that is served by fiber. And fiber is the building block for all of our connectivity services. So whether that is business internet, home internet, you know, residential services, whether that is our um, video platform or whether that is wireless service, be it 2G or 5G, depending on where you live, fiber is what makes it possible. Right now, 97% of Alaskans live in GCI's wireless footprint, and uh, we predict or we're on track to have 50% uh, of Alaskans covered with 5G service, uh, which is the highest uh, availability, fastest wireless service available. And we'll have that coverage by the end of 2022. We've invested uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to do these upgrades over the past years. And so this uh, continual investment, continuous investment is what is, uh, makes it us able to deliver these kinds of speeds across such a vast uh, area for our customers. Uh, last year, we announced that GCI is on the path to 10 gigabits per second internet speeds. And this is kind of, this is where the, you know, the telecommunications nerd in me comes out. It's not very, probably exciting for folks outside the industry. But for GCI, a small, you know, relatively small provider to make this commitment to upgrade to these kind of speeds is really mind blowing in the industry. Um, to get these kind of speeds and the capacity to provide our customers with, you know, the services that they need, you know, the growing need for school from home and work, people who are working from home, you know, there, the strains on, and the demands on our network just continue to grow and grow and grow as people want to do more. So we're making the commitment to grow to 10 gig. And uh, we were the first in the nation, we were the first in Alaska to provide one gig service. Um, we recently launched two gig service to all uh, Alaskans on our fiber network. And so uh, we've made the commitment, we've made a, a bold claim and we're well on the path to doing that. And as we talk about uh, gig service, I just wanna remind folks that two gig, or not remind you, but to let you know, you'll hear some terms, but two gig equals 2000 megabits per second. And this speed is really important um, to be able to deliver, as I said, the, the data rich experience and connectivity that people are looking for these days, our customers want. Um, and it's particularly important when you think about the service that is generally in, available in remote and rural areas. Right now, um, when we provide service in rural communities, our priority is to make sure the hospitals, public safety agencies, and schools are connected. And whatever capacity is remains is what we provide to our customers. And uh, sometimes with that, um, with that, we just don't have the capacity to provide the speeds for everyone. So in, if you're in rural Alaska, you may get 25 megabits per second, 10 megabits per second. So it's, it's a stark difference between urban and rural service that's available right now. Um, but we're really 
and I just want to go back, but what we're really proud of is that when you look at the map, our two gig service is available to 80% of Alaskans. So two gigabits fiber service being the gold standard of connectivity, uh, not only in Alaska, but across the nation, across the globe. 80% of Alaskans have access to that two gig service. If you're in Anchorage and you have GCI's um, uh, package or connectivity, our highest package, right now, you used to get one gig service up to a year ago. We upgraded to two gig, you automatically receive that two gig service. So you are receiving some of the fastest speeds in the nation with GCI service right now. We're really proud in terms of closing the digital divide. We're continuing to build on that um, to kind of chip away at that remaining 20% of Alaskans who don't have access to fiber service. Um, we partnered with Quintillion last year, and we were very proud to be able to deliver gigabit service, two gig service to Nome and Kotzebue. Um, we launched that in, I think, October to October of last year. With that, it's kind of a, if you build it, they will come scenario. We saw an increase of 560% use in uh, data in those communities. They had previously been at 10 gigabits per second. Now they are 2000 gigabits per second. That's what fiber does. That is how you close the digital divide. And again, these are services, two gigabit service is not widely available in the lower 48. I think there are some neighborhoods in New York that are starting to get it, some neighborhoods in LA, but there is no company that is deploying these fast speeds universally like GCI is doing, community-wide, almost statewide. So, if, you know, I like to point this out. If you're in downtown uh, New York City, you're not going to be able to get two gig service. You're going to have to look for it, whether you're for a, as a consumer or a business. In Anchorage, these are the kind. Of, these are the kind of. Um, this is. These are the kind of buildings that get two gig service. We're really. We're really proud of it, and this is kind of mind blowing again in the industry. But I show you this because I really think Alaskans should be proud of the of the investments, not that just GCI is making, but that other providers across the state are making too to get re help us reach these one and two gig speeds, um, which are becoming so much more important and making Alaska so much more competitive now that um, a remote workforce is really a reality. If you can live anywhere in the nation, as long as you can connect to your job, why wouldn't you live in Alaska? Why wouldn't you live in the most beautiful state in the nation? Bill Pop, I know that is a message that you want to convey as well. And we're bringing these speeds um, because as I mentioned earlier, the demands on the industry on connectivity are only growing. You know, we, we think of how much more connected our homes are today. It used to be, you know, computers, sometimes your TV, maybe you're emailing, but now, you know, your refrigerator is telling you when you're out at work, when you're out of milk. Um, people have home security systems that, that, that are becoming more and more universal. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many people I know who bought a Peloton uh, during the pandemic to, to keep fit. And so the demands are only going to grow and GCI is making the investments and continues to make investments all the time in our network so that we are prepared um, for these growing demands. And with those um, investments, we're seeing really great results. We are um, named year after year, one of the fastest ISPs, not in Alaska, not in the Pacific Northwest, but in the nation. And when you look at GCI speed of um, 100 and, uh, 149 PSI, which is the PC mags me uh, measurement of speed, <clears throat> you'll see that we're right up there with leading pro national providers um, in terms of connectivity. So. Uh, I think that people don't expect that from GCI or people don't expect that from an Alaskan provider. Um, and I can tell you when we work with consultants who come up here uh, to, to work with us or when we talk to them, they're, they're blown away that um, a small kind of regional or state provider is able to keep up with um, national competitors. So let's talk about that in terms of closing the digital divide. You know, we, uh, as I mentioned, we, there are many challenges, especially in Alaska. I showed you this map of Alaska compared to the rest of the nation. That's familiar to everybody. But so when we're talking about connecting rural and remote areas, the communities that we have to connect are obviously the most remote in the nation. And so as folks in the lower 48 struggle, because perhaps there's um, 
not enough power or there aren't paved roads, you know, we're, we're challenged with incredible distances, no power grids, no roads, no access, everything has to be flown in. You know, I'm, I'm, I, Alaskans know these things, but it really is um, when we're talking about this broadband funding and how it's going to be deployed and talking about bridging the digital divide, you know, Alaska is um, the biggest challenge, but also, you know, the biggest opportunity with the federal funding that is coming. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I really want this this group to take home the fact that 80% of Alaskans have this act, have access to fiber, but it's really that 20% that we really need to continue to work on. So in the past, GCI really, you know, to, from an economics standpoint, and again, looking at that um, map of highly regulated lands, we've really relied on um, options like a microwave network, like our Terra network in Western Alaska, which is the series of microwave towers. It's a 3,300 mile kind of ring of connectivity where the towers talk to each other and deliver connectivity services. That was a, that was uh, that project, that was a mega project that was launched with a $44 million federal grant that we have since used to leverage over $300 million of GCI's at-risk capital to finalize and to build out that project. And it continues it's an, on an ongoing basis for maintenance. Um, you have a picture here of the helicopter. We have a specialty helicopter that we um, lease every summer to deliver thousands of gallons of diesel fuel to mountaintop towers, repeaters, where we fill up these 5,000 gallon tanks uh, to keep of diesel to keep our generators running, to keep the microwave towers running, to keep connectivity moving in Western Alaska. It's a huge challenge. Um, and as I said, you have to use all the tools in your toolkit when you're connecting Alaska. And this is the area in the red that our Terra um, project serves. And that was a project that we launched probably I think in 2009 and we finished in 2015. And already, as I mentioned earlier with the capacity, already the capacity has been strained just because the demands on connectivity grow and grow. So as you think about this in terms of closing the digital divide, you really have to think about now kind of the, a long-term investment strategy. How do you connect rural Alaska without Kind of these incremental projects. How do you uh, how do you work and put your resources into enduring projects? What are the, what's the best answer for the most communities? And I think the struggle for GCI and many providers across the state is that we are always trying to um, do more, provide upgraded services both in rural, uh, but also for our urban customers too. So it really is not a tension, but it really you have to be strategic, you know, you have a limited amount of resources. So how do we make sure that we bring the 3G, the 4G, the 5G into our urban markets like Anchorage while we're still uh, struggling a little bit with the tech, with, not with the technology, but with the infrastructure um, to build out in rural Alaska. So I'll talk to you about some of the, some projects, some rural projects that I'm really excited about um, that are, you know, helping us to chip away at that 20% and bridge the digital divide and really are an example of us, um, you know, thinking big, having big, bold plans for connectivity. So the first is um, our Unalaska AU Aleutians fiber project. Um, this was launched two years ago after years and years of planning. We were, we, when the grant opportunity came up, became available, GCI was able to get the grant because we've been thinking about this for a long time. So uh, we were awarded a $25 million USDA reconnect grant to build out an 800 mile subsea fiber starting in Kodiak to serve the Aleutian, the Aleutian Islands. And I love to show this picture to uh, policymakers, especially folks in DC, because it really reflects how remote Alaska is um, and how ambitious GCI's plans are. When we connect Unalaska later this year to two gig service, we're, we'll be connecting one of the most remote communities in the nation uh, to urban speeds, better speeds than what they have in most of the lower 48 or will have at that time. Um, the 
the communities that will be connected are listed here, Larson Bay, Chignik, Sam Point, King Cove, Akutan, and Unalaska. And it will, um, the project will start from our fiber that is that lands in Kodiak at present. And I think this is a powerful slide as well, because this is a $58 million project that will serve these six communities. And it's certainly the fiber has the opportunity um, to serve other communities along the chain. But the, uh, the grant we applied for was, was for these six specific communities. But we're um, going to be serving on Alaska. You know, it's the nation's, one of the biggest fishing ports in the nation. Um, it is going to be one of the gateways to the Arctic. It's a huge maritime uh, resource, as folks on this call know. Um, but it's a relatively small population, but lots of great industry there that needs to be supported. But along the way, we are stopping off and providing uh, two gig fiber service in King Cove, Chignik Bay. There's 98 people who live there. Larson Bay, 80 people. So when you talk about connectivity, bridging the digital divide, delivering digital equity, um, you really have to be uh, committed. You really, uh, we, we absolutely need federal funding as part of the scenario because you're making such a huge investment to serve really small populations and the business folks on this line will absolutely understand um, how difficult, difficult it could be to make a financial model, a business model work when we're talking about these kind of populations and this kind of project. Uh, we have a few other projects in the works um, with the federal funding that has become available. And the, one of the ones that we're, like, we're excited about, I wanted to give you an update on, is GCI's Bethel Broadband Fiber Project. This would be leveraging our current fiber at Levelock to do a half terrestrial, half subsea fiber. Um, I think it's going to be a proposed $43 million project, but would then serve um, Platinum Eat, Neposkiak, uh, Oscarville and Bethel. And then once we have, and by bringing fiber into these communities, which are now served by Terra, the microwave network I talked to you about earlier, this would effectively, this would alleviate some of the traffic on our Terra network, that microwave capacity that I was talking about that was strained. Um, so not only will it bring fiber service, two gig service again to these tiny communities um, like Eek, but it will also um, help make connectivity better for the entire region by offloading some of the traffic from this very important rural hub. And the reason that we're able to propose these projects, again, vast distances um, and also uh, small populations, the, the reason that we're able to do this is because of the federal funding that has become um, available, which really represent uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity, which is why we're trying to be so thoughtful and make sure that we get it done right. Uh, some estimates, you know, we have a tsunami of federal funding coming, you know, overall for overall projects uh, in Alaska, some have estimated it up to 23 billion. I'm going to talk to you about specifically the connectivity and broadband funding that we anticipate coming. Um, to help manage the funding that, that's coming in, to help identify the needs in all of Alaska, but particularly in the 20% that remain um, not connected by fiber, the governor established a broadband task force that met extensively last year to develop an overall strategy um, for administering these funds as they, as they come. And um, I think they've got a great uh, mission statement or standard, robust, robust broadband service should be available to all Alaskans. Policymakers should expand, build out objectives to deploy infrastructure to meet the needs of unserved and underserved locations across Alaska. And I think that makes great sense. You know, really, we, um, you know, as I've illustrated, anyone along fiber that in a community with a fiber network, you know, you're going to have you have great speeds, you've got great connectivity, you have excellent capacity, and you're going to for the foreseeable future, just because fiber is kind of that unlimited asset. But if you're in rural, you're served by a microwave system or a satellite system, which are very expensive, relatively. Um, this is where we really need to make sure that we're deploying or thinking through projects that can bring um, this digital equity. Um, the broadband task force recognized that, uh, you know, because of the reasons I've talked about earlier, that fiber really is um, the priority. And that's how, as we get this funding in, if possible, we should try to push fiber as deep into rural as we can. 
And the way that this funding will be administered uh, over the next, I think it's going to, uh, I think people are still speculating about how it will come in, but I think most people are in uh, agreement that the funding will come in um, in tranches and we should, by the time uh, the governors, um, by the time Alaska gets it, we'll really need to evaluate and have our own criteria in terms of administering it. And we think, you know, to get the money in and to get the grants going and to get the evaluation, we see funding coming out, you know, over the next five years probably to, um, to make these investments, which is great because it gives us lots of time to think through and be strategic and to do it right. Um, but it also, if you're in rural Alaska and you are eager to get uh, connectivity, uh, you know, you want this process to be accelerated. So GCI is, is being strategic. We are thinking through all of our options. There'll be both federal funding and state funding available for um, broadband investment in the future. And um, we're, we're watching that closely as is the rest of the industry. And this is my last slide. I just wanna give you kind of a, a sense of the scope and the amount of funding that is coming in that will be available. It really is a once in a generation opportunity to bring transformational change to rural Alaska. Um, as you'll see in the first column, the bead money, that's the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. That's the money that is going to be allocated on a state-by-state -state basis based on several criteria, um, including a, like a, a formula for underserved and unserved communities. So currently there's a nationwide effort to map out uh, connectivity across the nation. Once those maps come back, that will really determine how much funding each state receives. Alaska will we'll get an out, we estimate we'll get an out or predict we'll get an outsized amount of that funding um, just based on the unserved populations that we have here in the state. So we're very uh, hopeful that we'll get, you know, between, we think we'll get over a billion dollars of that money, perhaps closer to two. Uh, we are also looking at the um, tribal funding. Uh, that is being deployed by um, NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Infrastructure Administration. Um, and that is an exciting opportunity because it really uh, lets our tribal partners identify the needs in their communities or in the, in the regions that they serve and work with broadband partners or providers to bring to uh, develop projects to connect uh, rural communities. So, um, GCI, the Bethel project that GCI is proposing is part of the tribal broadband program that NTIA uh, is going to, is granting. So we're looking at that as well. Um, and you'll see that uh, there's a $14.2 billion project up in the gray column for the FCC to administer, and that's the Affordable Connectivity Program. And that is intended to help provide, to offset the costs in high cost areas for delivering broadband. So that means consumers who live in these high cost areas, which I think we, we've talked about, or I've talked about uh, over this program, how challenging it is and how much it can cost to deliver connectivity in rural communities. Um, so the intent of this fund is to um, launch a program to ensure that uh, the connectivity is affordable um, in, in communities. So as you'll see, lots of, as you see, lots of funding coming um, lots of organizations, whether it's nonprofits or government agencies here in Alaska, um, are having conversations about this, about what is the best way, what's the best way to deliver the fastest, um, most uh, economic, most valuable service to our to communities across the state. And this is a huge responsibility. You really want to make sure that we get this right. You know, I think the pandemic has shown us over the past two years the importance of connectivity. We knew it was important before, but really in order to serve, uh, to educate for folks to, um, for education, for work from home, um, it, it's, it's a tremendous tool. I think we, we have only just begun to really recognize how critical it can be, how much of a game changer it can be, how much it can be um, a great equalizer um, in, our, in our state and prevent or, and present opportunities um, for, for economic development. So uh, with that, that is my final slide and I'm happy to take any questions you might have.
Heather, thank you. That was a very comprehensive presentation. Really, really informative. Um, you actually killed off one of my preset questions because you answered it thoroughly during your presentation. So that's just fabulous. I love it. So let me jump into a question here right quick. Can you talk about how closing the digital divide increases opportunities for remote work and what that means, especially in more rural parts of the state? Yeah, and Bill, I think we should talk about this too. Um, we need to get some really polished talking points on this because truly, if you can work anywhere, if connectivity, if you have the connectivity, if you have two gig speeds, you can do any remote work that other than maybe working for NASA, but actually maybe working for NASA. So um, if you can do that work from Nome, from Kotzebue, from Bethel, um, to me, that's a tremendous economic opportunity. And not only just for people to, you know, people from outside to come to Alaska and experience, you know, the lifestyle that they want, but is also critical, I think, to rural communities who want to retain their culture, who want to retain their history, their traditions. That means that people can live and raise their families where they grew up. They don't have to go to urban areas. And I think that's really something that we're gonna see become more and more important as we build out connectivity into remote areas, especially in Alaska. Couldn't agree more. I think there's tremendous opportunities for the delivery of education that would help in rural Alaska as far as citizens in rural Alaska wanting to develop their career pathway without having to leave their own home where they currently reside and then being able to work from that home based on the education that they get. And I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunities there. Um, another kind of changing tack a little bit, you know, the pandemic has profoundly changed how much we spend time online. Um, as demand for GCI services has increased dramatically over these past few years, um, how did GCI face any operational challenges and were there any, or did you guys just, you know, brush it off? No big deal. We've got this all squared away and it was easy or was I, or was this more likely, I'm, I'm assuming a little bit of a challenge given the suddenness of the surge? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And actually we were very apprehensive as we saw the pandemic coming. We couldn't predict, you know, it seemed like, and we only had a few months or a few weeks to figure it out. You know, we saw, that people would probably be, be working from home, learning from home. And so we did lots of modeling about what kind of, how would the behavior, what would the behavior look like? How could we change our traffic patterns from business to support more residential? And luckily it wasn't seamless, but it was, and I would say for the industry as a whole, it worked very well. I think um, the industry was tracking kind of the increased online activity and I think at some points during the pandemic, it jumped 40%. So you can you know, imagine if you had 40% more traffic on the roads or 40% more customers coming into your store, you're not prepared for that, right? It, it, so it really did take a lot of traffic management, technical stuff that from an engineering perspective, I'm not gonna be able to explain, but kind of this traffic management. But really, I think what saved us is that, as I said earlier, we, um, GCI continues to invest in our network. We have our eye on this 10 gig strategy. And so we've been like building the foundation and expanding and building and you know getting ready for growth this whole time. And those investments really, really paid dividends. I will say though, there were a couple of times when um, I think Call of Duty did a, a, an upgrade or and so and everybody was downloading it we were like oh no we can't do that while also working from home and school at home that was uh there were a couple of dicey times there but for the most part our um our network held up very well and ha and continues to outstanding so let's turn a little bit more to uh gci's contributions to the community because uh you're a great company for supporting the local community a couple of things Earlier this year, GCI contributed to the development of Mountain View here in Anchorage by donating a building to Shiloh Community Housing. Can you speak a little more as to how this donation came about and how it's impacted the area since? You know what, I would love to because I love this story. So GCI had a building on um, Mountain View Drive, a commercial facility. We put it up for sale and Shanae Williams from Shiloh Housing you know, and said, hey, I have an idea for you is she had this vision, this tremendous vision of providing kind of a one-stop shop for services in the Mountain View community. And Shiloh Housing already does great things, providing housing to at-risk uh, people and vulnerable people throughout the, the community. But she really needed a place to provide services. So she came, she had a vision. She told us she wanted um, 
She wanted the building. She wanted connectivity in the building. She has plans for a cafe and for some educational services. And I don't know if anybody on this call has ever encountered Shanae Williams, but like you just basically say yes to her. So um, she has yes. proven to be a, just a tremendous partner. Her enthusiasm is amazing. So we were very happy to hand over the keys to her early, earlier this year. And we're actually meeting with her, I think, next week to just talk about kind of what, what's happening now. But I think they expect the facility to be up and running um, by the end of this year and providing those kind of not only just services, but just a, a place for the community to get together. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to the impact that's going to have when it's fully operational. Oh, man. Well, let's follow on on that same path. Uh, within the past five years, GCI gives uh, has donated upwards of $10 million back into the community. So what factors are taken into consideration when deciding how this funding is allocated and how have these philanthropic efforts benefited the local economy? So um, GCI, we, we donate about $2 million every year in cash and in-kind services. Um, we've got two kind of key programs that we focus on. One is our scholarship program. Um, which provides two thousand, which provides one hundred thousand dollars worth of scholarships to fifty Alaska students. Um, we try to promote students who, or to select students who are focusing on STEM um, careers because that's so critical to us to keep um, STEM, like uh, to keep engineers and and the folks that we need in that pipeline because we want to hire Alaskans. So that's one piece of it. The other uh, piece is we donate uh, over $100,000 every year to the GCI Suicide Prevention Grant, and that's a, um, a partnership with, um, I'm blanking on the name right now, but they help us administer the grants. And to us, that was just a really meaningful way to give back to communities across the state to help something that really impacts um, Alaskans, unfortunately, at a higher percentage than most folks across the nation. And, with GCI having 2,000 employees and communities across the state, our team has been impacted by suicide. And it was really important for us to kind of step up and try to help support those organizations across the state who are trying to prevent suicides um, in Alaska. Uh, but the remaining funds, um, I would say the way that we give those out, we tried not to have any have many definitions or requirements around the rest of the funding because we recognize that you know, each community has unique needs and we want them to tell us what is most important to them. What is the priority? So we don't give to a specific, generally we don't give to a specific uh, or limit ourselves to a specific cause. Um, I think over the past, I'm pleased to say that we donate, um, I believe to 150 organizations this year, give or take. And so we tend to give out smaller grants um, smaller or smaller donations. And we have a very simple application process because we know that, you know, if you're a small nonprofit, if you're in a tiny Alaska community and you need help at the soup kitchen or the women's shelter, we want to really lower the bar any barriers that there might be for you applying for that, those funds. So I'd say, Bill, we try to be as universal as possible and, and fill the needs that communities tell us uh, matter most to them. And I think from an Alaska economy perspective, I guess I'm not quite sure how to answer that. We usually focus on the good that we do or the outcomes uh, from an impact perspective, uh, from, a, from a social or uh, a social good perspective rather than an economic perspective. Okay. Well, that's it for the prepared questions. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Kate right quick. Kate, do we have any questions from the audience and folks in the audience, please use the Q&A. Uh, for the button down at the bottom of your screen that you can use to submit questions and Kate will get those uh, uh, taken care of as we get them. So Kate, what have we sure. got? Yes, yes. So as Bill said, thank you for a very thorough presentation. We did just have one question come in. Uh, how do students apply for your scholarships? Is this directly through GCI, UAA or question mark? We have two ways to apply and thank you for the question. Uh, you can apply at gci.com, look at, for the gives. I think it's, I think it's gci.com slash gives. And that is our corporate giving page. And then we have, so, and those scholarships, I think I'm gonna say September might be when that scholarship program opens up. And then we have another specific um, scholarship for APU. That's the Donovan Walsh uh, scholarship program. And so you can uh, apply straight to APU. 
that last call, folks. Any other questions? It does look like there is one more in the huh? chat. So let me read that one. Uh, GCI participated in discussions on bringing upgrades to downtown Anchorage and how to create a more coordinated discussion as new development moves forward. We appreciate their time and great ideas. Excited about the next steps as the DT plan update is adopted this month by the assembly. Sounds like that was more of a comment than a question. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, so Heather, you I think the other comments are just comments. Yeah. Heather, did you wanna to touch on any of that in terms of the efforts that you guys put into that? That's not a simple process to be involved in i mean that's the you know this is this is community planning for the future and um i'm sure that uh you know folks would love to know what gci's view is of of where we need to be thinking about making sure that infrastructure so critical to the future of our city like broadband is taken into account in city planning well, I think in terms of Anchorage, we feel very comfortable with the infrastructure that we have and, and we're committed to making the ongoing investments to support whatever plans come up, wherever these planning discussions lead us. I think we feel well equipped and in a good place to support them. I was very peripheral on some of the conversations that, that have happened, but I know we're certainly excited about the possibilities whether that is um, providing connectivity for remote weather monitoring at a top, on top of some of um, our local buildings, whether that's providing wireless service in buses, whether that's providing Wi-Fi connectivity in parks and open spaces. Um, we can do it all. We just need, just let us know and we'll provide the connectivity and then you guys provide the story and the imagination and the, the outcomes. We're excited to facilitate that. I love the uh, visual that you just gave. Basically, you are providing the tapestry upon which we can sew the story that we want to sew. Bill, I'm writing that down. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, Heather, I think that that's kind of brought us to the end here today. Thank Cannot you. thank you enough for an amazing presentation. I learned a lot today about what's going on in GCI's planning and investments and the future of broadband in our state. It gives me tremendous hope for significant advancements for our state. And I'm a very happy user of GCI broadband services and thrilled to now have two gig. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I've noticed it in any number of ways in my streaming and in my just day-to-day -day web browsing, et cetera. It's just, thank you, um, because I could tell you, I hate waiting. Uh, I don't have time to wait, and uh, you guys have really made significant advancements on that front. Good. No one has ever told us, ah, oh, it's too fast. It, I have too much data. No one has ever <laughs> told us that. They just want more. So we're going to keep gonna keep investing. So I'm glad well, to hear it. I love it. Well, thank you for uh, your presentation, Heather, and thank you for everything that GCI is doing for our community. Uh, we are proud to have you as a member of our organization, and again, uh, great presentation. I am sure that everybody learned something new today and cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your busy day to be with us today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, Katie, thank you again to People AK for the generous sponsorship of the AEDC Voice Series. Uh, for folks online, we are working on our next one. Keep, uh, keep your eye out for the announcement of our next AEDC Voice and the great guests that we're going to be bringing in the future. And uh, other than that, I think we are all set. Uh, Katie, anything else to add or are we good? We're good. Thank you all so much. Have a good day. All right. Very good, everybody. Enjoy your day. Enjoy the sunshine. And uh, spring is here. Yay. It's a beautiful day in Anchorage. Get out and enjoy it. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Bye. -bye.